thank, obviously, uh, the organizers for the chance to lecture here, although I wish, you know, the original plan when, you know, this was set up a couple of years ago, I was going to, you know, come with my, like, my family, and it was going to be this, like, two weeks, and, you know, France and all that, and obviously this is slightly less, uh, uh, less than what I was hoping for. Um, so, uh, so what I, let me begin by kind of giving some motivation about what I want to talk about. Um, which has to do, um, so for motivation, let me, let's just start off with the case of a, a smooth curve of genus G. And then I can look at its uh, Hilbert scheme of points, of endpoints. Which since C is smooth is just the same as taking the uh, the symmetric power of the curve. And so there's a, there's a very nice uh, formula going back to, well, probably in this version, it's older, but you know, on the level of say cohomology goes back to an old paper of McDonald, which says that if I take the, uh, Euler characteristics of these Hilbert schemes, and I sum over N, well, this just has a very nice formula where it's, I just take uh, one minus Q to the two G minus two. Which I can then kind of, you know, make more complicated in kind of a dumb way by writing it as one minus Q to the two G over one minus Q squared. And now the numerator of the right-hand side uh, itself has kind of a, a geometric meaning. If I take the Jacobian of my curve um, and I take its cohomology, well, we know what that is. It's just a uh, exterior algebra of H1 of my curve. And so if I take the Poincare polynomial here, the Jacobian, uh, where I'll just introduce a minus sign. Oh, that's exactly uh, the numerator of this expression. And so now what I have is I have some kind of, you know, kind of slightly silly identity where the left-hand side, I'm kind of summing up over all n these Euler characteristics of the Hilbert scheme. On the right-hand side, I just have a single space, just the Jacobian. Uh, but now I'm doing something a little bit more uh, uh, refined. I'm taking the actual cohomology instead of, uh, instead of just the Euler characteristics. And the, the, the Q kind of has a different meaning depending on which side I'm on. On the left-hand side, the Q is just uh, indexing which moduli space I'm working with. On the right-hand side, the Q is this kind of cohomological variable. It's helping me keep track of uh, my cohomological degree of the Jacobian. And so, I mean, in some sense, one of the things I would want to try to explain uh, and these lectures is uh, kind of an onsox due to many people. So there's going to be, I'll, I'll do the attributions later on when I actually get to it. But, you know, the kind of the, the iteration that I'll be talking about is kind of joint with uh, to Yukinobu Toda. Which basically, you know, proposes a way of extending this. The kind of much more singular curve. So, for instance, you know, curves in the kind of setting of Calabi out threefolds. And one of the things that I kind of want to get to, hopefully, is that, you know, you know, okay, so it's generally it's a conjecture, and you know, you can believe it or not, but you know, the cases where we can prove it uh, already kind of give you examples where something like this holds for extremely singular curves. And the, and the technique of proof is kind of nice because in some sense what the technique of proof really does is it, it reduces it to the case of the smooth case where it's originally just McDonald's formula. So there'll be some kind of chain of logic where kind of the, the final step will just be applying the original identity. Okay. Um, so let's see, so my, let me give kind of 
So, you know, I'll start talking about this properly in maybe the third uh, lecture. And so let me just say now kind of what I'm hoping to kind of cover in these five lectures, um, which is in the kind of, you know, first two lectures. I want to give some kind of overview about um, Donaldson Thomas theory, some version of which you saw in Richard's lectures um, last week. But uh, I'm going to focus really again on the setting of Calabiot threefolds. And in particular, the kind of perspective that you get when you get to in the Calabiot three setting is that instead of doing things intersection theoretically, there's kind of an alternate approach where you work you know, in this kind of constructible world. So you know, constructible functions and then That'll be today, and then eventually uh, tomorrow, uh, constructible sheets. Um, and then kind of in the remaining lectures, I want to then kind of talk about um, you know, this kind of picture that I just sketched out, which is this uh, notion of an approach to thinking about what are called Gopakumar Vasa invariants, which are you should just think of the analog of, of, of this as the analog of the right hand side of this McDonald's formula, some analog of what to put in the numerator in general, where we'll be using the kind of technology developed in the first couple of lectures to pursue that. And then in kind of the last lecture, I want to kind of talk about some, you know, related conjectures to this story, in particular, a, a, con a conjecture of Toto in the last couple of years, which is related to this. So these kinds of topics are related to kind of, you know, defining right-hand side of this McDonald formula. Um, are there any questions uh, uh, before I get started properly? So again, so I, if there are things that show up in the chat, I'm not really probably going to be, be able to see them so easily, I think, so hopefully uh, Hopefully Andre can uh, read them aloud in his uh, dulcet tones. Um, okay, so today, I wanna start talking really in some generality about, oh, yeah. uh, hello? Okay. About uh, num numerical Donaldson-Thomas theory. And so again, the, the setting uh, for today, I'll be focusing on kind of the geometric setting and specifically in the case where we start off with some kind of Calabiao uh, threefold. It does not, does not necessarily have to be uh, uh, projective. So just some, you know, algebraic threefold, smooth algebraic threefold with a uh, <coughs> nowhere vanishing uh, algebraic threefold. And the kind of you know basic moduli space that you associate here is going to be some moduli space, you know, M of X, which is going to be you know some moduli of you know stable, you know, coherent sheaves, the moduli space of uh, stable coherent sheaves, or you know more generally complexes of sheaves. on X with a fixed you know, discrete invariance turn classes. Indexed by some vector V in the cohomology. And so the, you know, the kind of, you know, classic, you know, version of this story is where you just take you know, maybe you fix the polarization. And then the moduli space you look at is just, you know, um, let's say, you know, Giesecker, stable, you know, sheaves on X. Uh, to avoid, you know, kind of stacky issues or 
issues with the abstractions, you uh, often will kind of trivial, you know, f fix an isomorphism of the determinant of ease. So here I'm giving some kind of examples. Um, For curve counting purposes, it's usually better to work with some kind of variation on these spaces. So, um, you know, the, the the old version that we kind of the the subject kind of started off with was was to work with the Hilbert scheme of curves, or rather, a Hilbert scheme of one-dimensional subschemes. On X. So here maybe I'm going to fix a, an element of H2. <laughs> and then I also fix an Euler characteristic. And so this would parameterize, you know, subschemes, one dimensional subschemes, where the support, the kind of one dimensional piece is class beta. And then the Euler characteristic of the structure sheet is n. Okay. And then one example that you know we'll see if I have time to talk about maybe in some is uh, the special case when beta is zero, and, and then you're just considering the Hilbert scheme of points on X. Now in these examples, the way you kind of put it into this framework of moduli space of stable sheaves is that instead of thinking about the subscheme and then the kind of surjection from the structure sheet, you just remember the ideal sheet. So you think of this. You look at the, uh, the ideal sheaf of your subscheme, which is a rank one sheaf on X with the trivialization of the determinants. And this turns out to be equivalent to looking at the Hilbert scheme. So the way you put it in this framework of moduli space of sheaves is by forgetting about your subscheme and instead remembering just the ideal sheet that cuts it out. But the, the version that's cleaner, and maybe actually uh, Rahul already has spoken about this in his lectures, or if not, he will um, soon, I'm sure is um, a variation, again, for curve counting purposes of the, of the Hilbert scheme construction, where you work with what are called stable pairs. And so this, this theory was developed by uh, Pondre Pondé and Thomas. Yeah. And so here, the moduli space, again, you kind of fix a curve class. You fix an integer. And then the data here in this moduli space is there's two pieces of data here. First is a, a sheaf E, which is one dimensional support. And is pure, so pure meaning it has no kind of you know zero dimensional subsheaves. And then the second piece of data is uh, just a, a section of the sheaf. And then the stability condition is just the statement that the co-kernel of this section is zero dimensional. So what does an object of this space look like? So the, the simplest kind of example to think about, if you haven't seen this before. Oh, I should just say what the discrete invariants are. So, so again, the support of the sheaf, just the cycle theoretic support, is going to be in class beta. And then the Euler is n. And 
so you know the way to think about what this space looks like the first approximation is let's say here is x and then um imagine the support of of e is let's say a, a smooth curve inside of x And so you could ask, what are all the stable pairs with you know fixed support like this? Well, the simplest is I just take um, the surjection OX to OC. So that's an example of a stable pair. But what I could also do is I could also take, you know, if I give you some line bundle on this curve, I could take E to be its push forward, which is now a coherent sheaf on X with one dimensional pure support. And then if I just, any, any non zero section of L will then produce a stable pair on X. So given non zero section here. It defines for me a section of E and the, the co-kernel of this, of the corresponding section of e, on E will exactly just be the, you know, the the zero locus of the section on the curve. So, so the way you can think about this is that you have some line bundle on this curve, and now I have some section. And so the same curve will contribute to, you know, many different stable pairs. Uh, just, you know, you take, you know, any line bundle with a section or equivalently any collection of points on my curve, there will be a corresponding stable pair on X. So if I, the contribution. Of C to, you know, all of these stable pair spaces. Ends up looking a lot like just, you know, taking the different symmetric powers of my curve. And so in particular, this will be kind of, you know, the left-hand side of this kind of McDonald inequality in general. And so again, how do we want to put this in this kind of setting of DT theory? So again, the setting of DT theory as I wrote it is that we're going to want to consider, you know, moduli space of, you know, sheaves or complexes of sheaves on X. And so here I have this kind of, you know, two-term complex. I just think of the corresponding, uh, object in the drive category. So I take this two term complex. I think of this as an element in the uh, drive category of coherent sheaves on X. And this is how I'm going to think about this moduli space. It's a moduli space of a certain kinds of, you know, two term complexes. If you, again, so one thing that's kind of, you know, instructive to do if, if, is, uh, you know, if X is, you know, projective, then this uh, space of pairs is also uh, projective. And so kind of a, a fun thing to try to do is just to understand what like lim certain limits look like in this space. So for instance, you know, maybe it's an exercise. This is a local question. So it doesn't really matter what, what the ambient space, what the, uh, ambient threefold is, but imagine I have, you know, two lines that are kind of colliding, two skew lines that are kind of about to collide in some limit. And then we, you know, know from, you know, Hartshorn or something that in the, the limit in the kind of Hilbert scheme of one dimensional subschemes is you get two intersecting now coplanar lines and a little fat point there. But this kind of limit isn't allowed in the stable pair space because the support of the sheep because the sheaf isn't pure. And so instead, what you can try to work out is what the, what the stable pair, what the limit of this kind of uh, thing in, in, in the stable pairs moduli space is, where the support of the sheaf is still going to be these two lines, but now there's going to be what used to be a kind of a fat point now gets replaced with some kind of non-zero co-kernel.
So these are kind of, you know, the examples of the kinds of moduli spaces, geometric moduli spaces that one can look at. Um, but actually, everything I'll be talking about today, it doesn't really have to be a geometric setting. So they're kind of the kind of main example of uh, non-geometric. Examples to look at are uh, come from looking at, you know, representations of, you know, quivers with potential. So every, everything I'll be saying today and tomorrow kind of makes sense in that setting. In particular, uh, there's, there's, you know, a lot of the material in uh, Marcus Reinecke's lectures, I think, will be relevant. Okay. So these are the kind of, you know, these are the examples I want to look at. And so... As always, uh, we're interested in some kind of virtual structure on these moduli spaces. And so in the context of Richard's talks last week, the kind of initial piece of data that you want to understand is something about the deformation theory. So you have a deformation and obstruction theory for understanding these moduli problems. which because I'm just working with moduli spaces of sheaves or maybe complexes of sheaves, they're given by X groups. So the deformation space, the tangent space is given by, you know, the self X one of whatever your sheaf or complex is. If I fix the determinant, then we usually do some kind of traceless thing. And then the obstruction space is then given by um, <clears throat> next two. And so again, my understanding is Richard kind of you know talked in more detail about uh, how these show up for uh, moduli of sheaves. And so already the first nice thing that happens in the Calabi out three case. So this is all for, so far everything is completely general, uh, which is uh, you get to apply ser duality. So if I take the dual of the obstruction space, I get an X one with this uh, twist by the uh, canonical bundle of X, but uh, because of, I'm in the Calabi out three setting, this is just trivial. So I get exactly the deformation space. And so particular, it means that the virtual dimension of my moduli space was just the difference in dimensions is zero. And so if, If X is proper, or at least if my moduli space is proper, that's really all I need. Uh, I have this, well, I have this virtual class, which is a zero cycle. And uh, under the properness hy hypothesis, I can take its degree, which will give me a number. So I'll call this kind of the virtual number associated to my moduli space, and it's just some integer. And the, the procedure for doing this, again, this is something that, you know, Richard sketched out is, you know, the, the way you produce this virtual class from all this data is basically by, you know, using some techniques from intersection theory. So that's kind of the, the world where these constructions uh, live most naturally. Okay, so what do I want to explain first then is, um, in the again in the Calabiao setting, what you know an, another uh, a way of thinking about what these numbers are. So this in, this is this um, notion of what we now call uh, Baron functions. And so the the setting here is that let's say I have some you know I have some Moduli space M, 
and I've equipped it with this kind of this, uh, perfect obstruction theory. Meaning I have some, you know, two term complex that calculates the deformations and the obstructions to my moduli problem. We say that E is symmetric. If I have a quasi isomorphism between E and uh, it's shifted dual. So you should think of you know e as being kind of supported in degrees negative one and zero, and then uh, so e dual is going to be shifted uh, supported in degrees zero and one, and then I shift it back, so it's, it's again supported in degrees negative one and zero. So I have some you know isomorphism like this with, with the symmetry condition, so such that this isomorphism itself has some kind of self duality property. So the easiest way to get a kind of theta like this is that, for instance, if I have, uh, let's say, if f is a vector bundle with a you know symmetric bilinear form alpha, then you know you can produce an example of you know a complex with this kind of symmetry just by taking you know uh, a map from f dual f dual to f, and then you you have a, using this bilinear form you can produce a Uh, a map like this, which exactly has this kind of symmetry. And so an example of a kind of a, so the baby example of a, you know, a moduli space with a two term perfect obstruction theory with this kind of symmetry. Is where your obstruction theory is kind of uh, Dom. So let's say M is smooth. And then your obstruction theory basically consists of the map from the tangent bundle of M to the cotangent bundle of M, which is just the zero map. So this is like I have an obstruction space, uh, but it's, it's all, those obstructions are all unrealized because the space itself, in fact, happens to be smooth. And in this case, if you calculate what the virtual class is, so it should be zero dimension. It's a zero dimensional virtual class because the uh, deformation of obstruction is the same dimension. Um, it's just going to be, uh, it'll just given be the, the, the Euler class of the cotangent bundle, which is my obstruction bundle. And if I take its degree, I just get up to assign the topological Euler characteristic of M. And so the, the first observation, with everything here I should say is, I'll be saying is due to uh, Kai Behrend, except for the name. He didn't, of course, name it after himself, but at some point it caught on. Um, so in the Kalabi out three settings, all the examples that I said before, Again, just the same ser duality calculation I did before tells you something a little stronger. It tells you that the obstruction theories are always symmetric. So let me give the kind of key local example of one of these symmetric obstruction theories, which we'll kind of use again next time, which is that imagine I have some ambient smooth space V, which is just affine space. And I have some function on it. And then the kind of, you know, space that I'm looking at, my actual moduli space, is just the zero locus of all the partial derivatives. This is just the critical locus of this function f.
So because it's, you know, it's some, it's a space cut out by a bunch of equations. It in particular has a, a, a nice two term obstruction theory. And then you can just write down what the obstruction theory is in this case. And it's basically determined by taking the, uh, the, the, the Hessian matrix or F. You take this kind of symmetric matrix given by taking the partial, the second partial derivatives. And so this defines exactly the kind of this, a, a symmetric obstruction theory. And this will be kind of the main example for us. So this kind of baby case is the case where the function was zero and it's kind of dumb, but in general, it's more interesting. Okay. So this is the, fr the framework for us. We have a moduli space. We have this kind of two-term obstruction theory, and it has this symmetry property. So definition, uh, a function, if I give you, you know, any kind of complex scheme, a function from the complex points to the integers is constructible if uh, the set of points where the function has some value, so new inverse of A, uh, this is a constructible set. So, you know, if I have some, you know, variety M, you know, there's going to be some open set where it has some value zero, and then maybe there's some locally closed set where it has value one, and then maybe some, some other stratum where it has value negative one. And then given one of these constructible functions, I can kind of do some, you know, version of integrating it, some discrete version of integrating it, where what I'm going to do is I'm going to sum... I'm going to look at all the kind of strata where the function has some value, and I'm just going to add up those strata weighted by the, add up the Euler characteristics of those strata weighted by the value of the function there. So if I, for instance, if I just had the constant function one, I would just be getting the uh, topological Euler characteristic of M. But of course, in general, I'll get something else. And then in particular, I can look at, you know, for instance, just the, you know, abelian group the, of constructible functions, z-valued constructible functions in M. And, you know, one way of thinking about this is this, if I just look at characteristic functions, this is a, a basis indexed by irreducible subvarieties. Do you only assume finitely many non-empty fibers? Yeah, yeah, yes, that's right. I'm sorry, M is going to be, you know, just a finite type thing. So that's right, only finitely many. And so the, the key theorem that kind of kicks off, for me at least, this, the whole direction of this subject, is that if I give you M with the symmetric obstruction theory, in particular, any moduli space of, you know, sheaves or whatever on a Calabiat threefold. There exists, you know, associated to M and E, there exists a constructible function on M such that if M is proper, And a virtual number of my moduli space, meaning in the sense of taking the degree of a virtual class, is the same as what you get by integrating this constructible function. And so what it means is that you know the the you know this intersection theoretic quantity, it means that you can kind of study it using ideas from kind of constructible geometry or micro-local geometry. 
So let me just say a couple of you know remarks about this. I'll, I'm going to say something about why this is true in a second, but let me just kind of say what, what's kind of so interesting about this. Um, it, it it allows you a couple a co to do a couple of things that you couldn't really make sense of intersection theoretically. So for instance, you know, if I this, this virtual cycle, so it's really a cycle class, and so um, if I give you, you know, some subset. <laughs> Of M, it doesn't really make sense to talk about, you know, what is the contribution of Z to the you know, to the virtual class because you can't really, you know, localize. Um, you know, there's not a clean way of localizing this kind of zero cycle class to all the different, you know, to come along some stratification of M. On the other hand, if I give you um, a constructible function, it's very easy to do it because I can just restrict my constructible function to Z and I can, you know, integrate it there. Um, Uh, second, uh, the right-hand side makes sense even if M is not. Uh, uh, proper. So usually the left-hand side, unless you're in some kind of equivariant setting, like in Richard's lecture, if I, if I have a non-compact moduli space, it doesn't make sense to take the degree of a, a zero cycle class on it, but you can always just integrate this uh, constructible function. Um, on the other hand, the, the left-hand side, of course, uh, uh, because it's defined, uh, because it's defined yeah, intersection it's theoretically, it's is a deformation variant. Yeah. At least in the proper situation, I mean, which is the only time it makes sense. And uh, something like the right-hand side, if I just take, for instance, uh, the actual topological Euler characteristic, that is as M varies in you know, a flat family, that's certainly not going to be a deformation invariant. And so there's something going on with this kind of specific choice of constructible function that's kind of correcting for uh, the failure of the Euler characters to be deformation invariant. So this is not, this is really not at all obvious from. <laughs> from how it's defined. Okay. And so this ends up being ex an extremely useful theorem. I'll, let me just say, I won't, maybe I won't write this down. One way this gets used a lot is when you study how, um, how these invariants change under uh, change of stability and wall crossing and so on, which is that when you kind of cross some kind of a wall and your stability condition changes, your moduli space usually changes maybe by some kind of flip or flop or something like that. And so, you know, understanding how the zero cycle trans the cycle class transforms might be kind of delicate, but this kind of uh, weighted Euler characteristic, you know, if there's some open part where the two moduli spaces are just the same, then you can just throw it out because the contribution to this kind of, you know, integral is going to be the same. And you can just focus on the kind of the actual strata where, uh, where, the, where the stability is changing. So this ends up being kind of an extremely powerful tool for those kinds of analyses. So let me um, sketch the proof of this result. And it goes into how this kind of uh, virtual class is defined, which again, I think, I believe Richard covered in his first uh, couple of lectures. Well, the idea is that, you know, if you have M embedded in some kind of, you know, smooth space, let's say, then um, the way you get this virtual cycle is that you have, you know, M sitting inside V, and then there's some kind of a vector bundle over V, and then there's some kind of cone with multiplicity sitting inside of S. So this is some kind of conical cycle. Not a cycle class, an honest to God cycle inside of this vector bundle. 
And then when I intersect it with the zero section, I get exactly this virtual class. So this is true just in general. But what, what Kai showed in his paper is that if you now add the condition that the obstruction theory is uh, symmetric, again, like in the Kalabi S situation, um, you can actually refine this picture so that this vector bundle S is actually the total space of the cotangent bundle of V. And this conical cycle inside of the cotangent bundle is not just a cone, it's a, it's a Lagrangian cone. This cotangent bundle has a natural symplectic form. And when I say this cone is Lagrangian, I mean that every, the, the, you know, the smooth locus of every irreducible component of this cycle is Lagrangian in the usual sense. The symplectic form restricts to a zero and it has you know, middle dimension. So why is that um, so special? Well, so there's a, a natural, there's a isomorphism between on the one hand, constructible functions on V And this free this free abelian group of conical Lagrangian cycles. Which is known as the uh, characteristic cycle map. It takes a constructible function here and sends it to what's called the construct uh, the characteristic cycle of this function. And this is defined in some sense via via some kind of uh, a Morse theory type construction. These it, it, the fact that there is an isomorphism like this shouldn't be kind of super surprising. Each of these spaces has a basis that's indexed by these irreducible subvarieties. So I already talked about how um, irreducible subvarieties just by taking the characteristic function defines a basis here. Similarly, if I give you an irreducible subvariety, I can take the, um, the smooth part and I could take its co-normal bundle, which is the Lagrangian inside of here, and I can take its closure. And so that gives me a natural basis here, but that's, that identification is not what's used to define this isomorphism. It's a little bit more subtle than that. But what's great about this construction is that uh, on each side, there's an evaluation map to the integers. On the left-hand side, when I take a constructible function, I can just integrate it. And on the right-hand side, I, if I give you a, um, a conical cycle, I can take the degree of its intersection with the zero section. And the way this characteristic cycle construction goes is that, you know, this diagram commutes. So this is what's called the uh, index formula. Due to, I don't know, it's due to many people. So, you know, maybe Dubson, Shiwara. So this is just a very general statement about, uh, you know, constructible functions on V and Lagrangian cycles of the cotangent bundle that you can kind of set up an isomorphism, which makes this diagram commute. Uh, I'm not going to, I won't actually, I, you know, I, if I had more time, I would actually, I had an idea of from sketching a proof of this kind of index formula. There are a lot of proofs. The, the one I like the most is in a paper of Schmidt and Valonen. Or basically, they just reduced to the case of understanding, uh, you kind of pass to the real analytic world, and then you reduce to the case of understanding like tiny, a tiny ball. Um, and so this is great. You see, the right hand side is exactly what we want to define the virtual class, the degree, the virtual number. Uh, the left hand side is the kind of thing that, you know, Barron's theorem is about. So to, to produce this kind of Barron function in the statement of this theorem, I'm going to take the conical Lagrangian cycle that's associated with my obstruction theory and just move it over to the left. So this is now what we what we now call the Baron function is just it's whatever constructible function 
maps to this obstruction cone under this characteristic, characteristic cycle map. And so that's exactly how you kind of go from the intersection theoretic world over to this kind of constructible world. So then this begs the question, what do we know about this Baron function? How do we, this is kind of a somewhat abstract uh, statement. How do we kind of compute it in you know, any examples? And in general, it's quite hard. So, you know, I would say if I give you a kind of a random moduli problem and I give you some random point in the moduli space, you know, it, it's not so easy to kind of compute this thing. Um, but some cases we have some kind of statement. So for instance, the easiest case is when M is smooth. M is smooth, you can again kind of put this stupid, uh, um, you know, this, um, this, this is the baby example where I just have the zero fun, uh, the, the zero section defines for me a, a symmetric construction theory. And then the Baron function in this case is just a uh, constant, just negative one to the dimension. And then Baron's theorem says exactly what I wrote before. If I integrate the Baron function, I'm getting negative one to the dimension times the topological Euler characteristic of M. which is the degree of this kind of virtual cycle that we associated it before. Um, what about this local example I did up here? So here I kind of wrote down this key local example where I take the critical locus of a function So M is the critical locus of a function F in N variables. And so in this case, um, if I give you some point on M, the value of the Baron function, again, it's something pretty nice. This is related to what's called the uh, the Milner number, maybe, I'll put, maybe the reduced Milner number of my function at P. So it's some kind of notion in singularity theory, which let me just state what it is. So given a, a function and some point in the critical locus, I can take the, uh, the Milner fiber which is just, I take a, um, you know, a tiny, I take a, a ball of, you know, a closed ball of some tiny radius around my point P, and then I intersect it with um, the fiber. So let's, let's assume that F of P is zero make my life easier. And then I just intersect it with a nearby fiber of my uh, function. So here epsilon is much less than delta, which is much less than one. And so then the, what the Baron function is in this case is I'm just taking again up to a sign, taking one minus the Euler characteristic of this Milner fiber. So this isn't super explicit, but it's again, something familiar from, uh, from, uh, from singularity theory. So there's a question in the chat. Uh, do you assume that the singularity is isolated and what if it's not? Oh yeah, I am not assuming the singularity is isolated. You can still, this definition makes sense in general and maybe it makes it a little harder to think about, but it, this definition still makes sense. So I'm just- so, uh, uh, a notational thing, you wrote X is in B, do you mean X is in AM? 
Oh, sorry. Yeah, V was AN. That's right. Yeah. So let me give a let me give a a more complicated example where you get to kind of see this. So, um, so let's say I want to, let's say, so I'm going to take the following kind of Calabi out threefold. I'm going to take a three, three hypersurface inside of P2 cross P2, which if I kind of, pre this is, you know, this is a Calabi out threefold complete intersection. I project onto P2 and I get a, an elliptically fibered Calabi out threefold. I'm going to pick it, uh, you know, to pick the uh, defining equations such that um, this is some elliptic. So that one of the one of the singular fibers of this vibration is uh, sitting inside of P2, just given by you know x squared times y. So so one of the fibers. It's this um, reducible, non-reduced cubic inside of P2. So this, is, so this fiber looks like, you know, maybe 2C1 plus C2. And so if I'm going to look at the following, you know, moduli space of sheaves, I'm going to look at... Um, I'm going to look at uh, sheaves, which are one-dimensional one sheaves where the support is C1. So that kind of, I take the, the, the non-reduced component and I just take the, the underlying reduced curve, which is just a P1. And I basically, you know, I'm just going to set my discrete invariance to be whatever the train character of the structure sheaf of this curve is. So the, the support of the sheaf is C1 and the Euler characteristic is 1. And so I can look at the corresponding moduli space of she's on X and set theoretically, it's just a point. This is the only object in it. But it turns out, and this is the calculation, this is um, from Richard, you know, 30 years ago or something, uh, is that this moduli space scheme theoretically is non-reduced. So you can see what this is, is first of all, I mean, it's cut out the equations u squared v squared. So this is the same as looking at the critical locus of the function u cubed plus v cubed, because the, you know, these up to three, these are the partial derivatives. And so, okay, so, so then, you know, so you, this is a pretty explicit function. You can work out uh, what, this, uh, what this Milner number calculation gives you. So if you, Well, it's just a point. So, so the, the value of the Baron function at this unique point ends up being negative one squared, one minus negative three. So this negative three is exactly this Euler characteristic of the Milner fiber in this case. This value four. On the other hand, you know, this thing is uh, zero dimensional. So the, the, uh, so the virtual dimension equals the actual dimension. So the, the virtual class in this case, if I just calculated it, this is just the length of this zero dimensional scheme, which uh, is four. So as expected. Um, So, um, 
All right, so this is the main theorem. So what I'd like to kind of do in the, I guess I'll start this now and then I'll continue this tomorrow. Is I want to kind of sketch, you know, how this, you know, give some indication about how this theorem gets used. This is, ends up being a really useful theorem for understanding, uh, for calculating these uh, these numbers. And so, okay, so what I'll maybe do is I'll just do, um, one example now, and then I'll just, I'll start it now and I'll kind of uh, finish it tomorrow. So let me state this theorem. And so this is gonna be a theorem about these, you know, these stable pair invariants. <laughs> this was this, um, this space of stable pairs, and then the, we can define a, a generating function where I fix beta and then define what I'll call the PT series. Which is just the virtual number of these spaces summed over Q. Which again is kind of should be reminiscent of the kind of generating function that I started this talk with, where I took the, uh, the summation of the Euler characteristics of all the Hilbert schemes for a fixed curve. So this is going to be the kind of general version for an arbitrary caveat. And so the theorem is that so again, uh, so x here was my caveat threefold. Is that this generating function is uh, the Laurent expansion. Q of a rational function, a symmetric with respect to uh, Q goes to Q inverse. In other words, it's basically built out of things that look like, you know, Q to the one minus R, one plus Q to the two R minus two. So you can express this uh, generating function in terms of these, uh, specific rational functions. And so, okay, so I, I, what I want to do is I want to kind of sketch the proof of this in the special case when beta is reducible, this is the proof due to Ponder, Ponder, and Thomas. And I, what, what's kind of nice about this, so I won't do it now, I mean, I'll do that uh, tomorrow. Um, but let me just say why uh, this is a nice result, which is that um, uh, you know this rationality is something that we expect for any threefold. But right now we can only prove it because this is expected for all threefolds, um, and we can prove it, you know, for things like you know complete intersections and so on. But in terms of a really general, this is a really general statement. Uh, if we um, the only case where we can prove it really in some kind of generality without knowing something really specific about the geometry of X is, uh, is in this Calabia center. Well, okay, this is not only known, but the kind of, you know, for general, in general, we don't know. What, what's special about the Calabiao case is precisely we get to use this kind of constructual approach to, uh, to prove this kind of theorem. Um, so I'll, I'll maybe say like a, you know, a few lines about this argument uh, tomorrow. Uh, let me uh, stop here. Thank you. In the examples you wrote down of the variant function, is it worked out by going through this sketch you outlined, or the functions could found differently? Uh, you mean the examples of what the variant function is? Yeah. Yeah. I, so right. So, so in the examples I wrote down, 
uh, you can, you know, you can calculate this number number is, is something that you can calculate. We have like techniques for calculating it. And so, so that's, that's basically how you can do it. So like, for instance, uh, you know, it turns out that, you know, finding the Milner fiber, the Milner number for like UQ plus UQ, that is something you can more or less do by hand. Uh, and then, and then you just work it out and you get this, you know, negative three popping out. Um, and in general, there is kind of a, a procedure for calculating it. You know, if you have, um, like a, a function and you have like a lot of time, uh, then there is like an algorithm for calculating what the, what the, what the Milner number is it, but it, it for, you know, usually the geometries we're interested in get, you know, get larger and larger dimensional. And so getting your hands on it, isn't really, um, feasible in practice. Like if you want to do like, and so an, an example of, here's an example of something that I, you know, that we like is, you know, if you do like the Hilbert scheme of points on C3, uh, the function that you would want to find them, you know, the, the Milner numbers for is, in some sense, pretty explicit, but involved, you know, three n by n matrices. And so if you wanted to actually kind of, you know, do that for any given point in the Hilbert scheme, this is actually quite difficult. More questions? Yes, we have one. So if I take uh, an Arpinian scheme or a set point, uh, um, is it true that uh, the bearing function uh, is bounded above by the length of the of this uh, fat point? Sorry, say that again. If I take a fat point, uh, so a spec of uh, an Arpinian ring, uh, so I have only one closed point, like in the example uh, by Richard. Mm -hmm. So is it true that the length of this uh, fat point uh, is an upper bound uh, for the bearing function? Yeah, I mean, again, up to a, I mean, so I think, it, so, I mean, if the, you know, if it's coming from one of these, uh, maybe it's just equal to it even in general, I, it's definitely equal to it if you know it's, um, it's, uh, it's coming from a, coming from a critical locus. That's just what the theorem yes. says. Um, but if yes. it's not coming from a critical locus, there's still a definition of the Baron function. And then, you know, maybe it's still equal to it in that case. But, uh, but in, in the cases but that show up naturally, it'll always just equal that length. Right, certainly it can be smaller. I was wondering if it can be bigger as well. Probably not. No, pro no, I, yeah. I, th I think that's right. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, then let's thank Rubesh again. Thank you.